This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Pella McDaniels, and I'm the faculty curator of African American Collections and assistant professor of African American Studies here at Emory University. And on behalf of Emory Libraries and the Manuscript, Archives, and Rare Book Library, I want to welcome you all uh, to this conversation, uh, probably uh, one of the most important because this is the last week of the SCLC mm -hmm. exhibit up here in the Shatton Gallery. Uh, this uh, afternoon, uh, the conversation between uh, Dr. Bernard Lafayette and Dr. Carol Anderson will be moderated by Dr. Carol Anderson. I'm going to give you a little bit about her, a little bit of background. And again, my role is to introduce her, and, and beyond that, I will be uh, whatever they need me to be as it relates to carrying a microphone around the room. <laughs> uh, so it is more than appropriate uh, to have the faculty curator of the SELC exhibition, Carol Anderson, lead this conversation with uh, one of the key figures of the SELC. An associate professor of African American Studies, Anderson's research and teaching focus on public policy, particularly the ways that domestic and international policies intersect through the issues of race, justice, and equality in the United States. She is the author of Eyes Off the Prize, The United Nations and the African American Struggle for Human Rights, 1944 to 1955, which was awarded both the Gustav Myers and Myrna uh, Burneth Book Awards. Her, her forthcoming book, Bourgeois Radicals, the NAACP and the Struggle for Colonial Liberation, 1941 to 1960, uncovers the long hidden and important role of the nation's most powerful civil rights organization in the fight for liberation of peoples of color in Africa and Asia. Uh, without further ado, so we can get on with the show, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much, Pella. And there is a, um, a line in the Eyes on the Prize series where Reverend Abernathy says, this show is your show. <laughs> and today this show is Reverend Dr. Bernard Lafayette's show. And so I'm just going to ask a few questions and um, can't wait to hear you basically, as I said, riff um, on the incredible work you have done in trying to transform America, in the work that you have done in making it able for us to be here in this space today. So first of all, I just want to say thank you. So you have just finished your memoir. And in there, and, and you've got to buy it. I've, I've got two copies, Kindle and paper, I'm just saying. <laughs> and in there, one of the things that you talk about is that when you came back from up north, you, after raising $30,000, and you were looking for your directorship uh, from SNCC, and you get to the office, and the folks at SNCC say, ah, everything's gone. And, uh, and we had to take Selma off the map because that's hardcore. That's hard time. And, and understand, these are the folks who have gone into Mississippi. And you looked at Selma and said, yeah, I got this. <laughs> Tell me about that. Tell us about that. What it took to have the courage to go where the most courageous would not. Well, I'll tell you. Um... I've often reflected on that question myself, and I've often asked myself that question. <laughs> Why did I go to Selma? Uh, one thing I'd like to say in uh, preface to that is that when I was on the Freedom Rides, mm -hmm. I remembered Selma. You know, the bus ordinarily would go through Selma yes. on the way to Mississippi. But you know what happened? There were 2,000 people at the bus station in Selma, Alabama. We had the National Guard, okay, out of Maxwell, you mm -hmm. know, Air Force Base and all that kind of stuff. We had the state troopers and everybody. They chose to bypass Selma. Now, that's what they did, okay? And this is the Army. <laughs> they didn't want to tangle with Selma, okay? And uh, the other thing you should know is that during the Meredith crisis, they had 300 possumen 
from Dallas County on horseback, led by Jim Clark. I think it was General Walker was the one who had some kind of psychiatric problems. But he was leading the, the group. But you had that kind of uh, presence. So Selma has a, a reputation that far exceeds the, uh, the imagination of what racism could be like. But I didn't know very much about Selma, except the fact that two other SNCC groups had gone down. And like you say, they came back with the same report that uh, we can't accomplish anything in Selma because the white folks are too mean and the blacks are too afraid. Well, that struck my curiosity because we were scared going to Mississippi. <laughs> I remember on the freedom rides, we crossed the line. Even with all those troops and everything, we said, we're going into Mississippi now. And if you remember on the film, I said, uh, it said, welcome to the Magnolia State. Mississippi, Magnolia State. Yes. And then the next sign said, prepare to meet thou God. <laughs> and I took it literally. You had to be prepared. But for Selma, Alabama, it was more of an academic assignment for me. I was curious to find out why. That was main, my main motive was to find out why blacks were so afraid and why uh, whites were so mean. So the first thing I did, it was got into an academic study. I had two years of college, and I've gone and I've taken sociology. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to be the director, so I could be in charge of how we're going to manage, you know, manage this project. Mm -hmm. Okay, they wanted me to be the assistant to Bob Moses, Mississippi. I turned it down. They wanted me to be an assistant to uh, Charles Sherrod down in Southwest Georgia, the other two places. You know, I turned it down because I really wanted to have a chance to experiment. Okay. So one of the first things I did was uh, I did a 50-page paper. <laughs> My students are familiar with that. <laughs> but I don't know if they knew where it came from. That was the beginning of the 50-page paper. OK, <laughs> now you know. <laughs> You've got to really have good information if you're going to make good decisions. You know, you, you, at least you have given it your best. So the first thing I researched was, where should I do my research? OK? So I needed to find out why the white people were so mean. So one of the things I looked for was the publication of the White Citizens Council. I found out they had a publication once a month. So I wanted to find out that where that publication could be uh, accessed. And there weren't a lot of libraries that I could go to, you know, because of my own you know, ethnicity. So I had to find a, a place where they, uh, uh, imagine this now, in those days, Negro. Mm -hmm. A Negro library that would take a subscription to the White Citizens <laughs> Council. <laughs> there was only one. And I checked all of them out now. There was only one library, and that was Tuskegee Institute, Alabama mm. uh, University. Mm. Tuskegee University. Now, you know, it's called university. Then it was an institute. So that's where I put my boots down. And I began to study, and I began to explore. So my motivation was actually uh, doing the research to find out why people were so mean. So my, my effort in Selma, Alabama, was testing my hypotheses. It was an academic study. And all I did was ask a lot of questions. I didn't make any assumptions. But if they said that white folks were so mean, I wanted to find out why. Black folks were so scared. What was it that caused them to be so scared? And I found out. I found out. And I, most of the work I did in Selma, Alabama, was studying the people and then learn how to respond to those situations. 
Now, I must tell you, there was a, a lot of uh, humor in what I was doing. So for example, I went into uh, Jim Clark's uh, office, sheriff, and uh, you know he had a bad reputation. So uh, I did have respect for him, you know, and why people are afraid of him and that kind of thing. But I wanted to see what he, how he would respond to a black person who was not afraid of him. I needed to find out, okay? So I went to his office, and I, you know, knocked on the counter, and I said, "I want to see uh, Sheriff Jim Clark." And the lady, the clerk, went back and got him, and he came out swagging and that kind of thing. And he said, uh, "Who wants to know?" <laughs> okay. I said, uh, "I'm uh, Reverend Lafayette." And to be honest with you, the, the Reverend did help me in many cases. <laughs> I didn't mind being a Reverend. <laughs> Even though I was kind of a young in those days. I had gone to the you know, American Baptist College for a couple of years and was already um, licensed. I wasn't ordained, but I was licensed. So I said, I'm Reverend Lafayette, and I want to make my acquaintance with you because I'm going to be here directing the voter registration project. And I want to be in touch with you in case if uh, you ever need me for anything after hours. Uh, here's my personal phone uh, number, my home number. And uh, he uh, got it because I had it written down. And then he said, uh, I said to him, uh, by the way, uh, what is your home number in case if something comes up? <laughs> if, I, if I need to get in touch with you, you know, after hours. And he looked at me, because he'd probably never been confronted that way before. And I was being businesslike, you know. I didn't have a, a business card, but, you know, <laughs> in those days. And um, he looked, and he looked at the ceiling, he looked at the floor, he looked at the walls. And then he looked at me and said, uh, it'd be best for you to contact me here at the office. And I was a little you know, chagrin, taken back, because I'm trying to be, you know, business-like, you know, and the courtesies and being, you know, the etiquette for business, you know, we exchange numbers. But then I gained respect for him later, because I found out that that's where he stayed. He stayed at the holding cell at the jail, at the county jail. You see, the city jail was the one that held, you know, a lot of inmates, but the the uh, the county jail was just one cell, and he slept in it at night. Now, it was not his commitment, uh, Dr. Durley. Uh, his wife had put him out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's when I sort of equated uh, a jail cell with a uh, what do you call it? Doghouse? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. So that's where he stayed. But it was more of curiosity and learning and experiment uh, that motivated me to go to Selma. Okay. And in campaigns for justice, that's what Selma was. I mean, looking at a place where you had a handful of African Americans who had been able to register to vote. Um, you had Sheriff Jim Clark standing on the, the courthouse steps for the, what, the, the two days a month that registration was available? Yes. Two days a month. Yeah, I, believe, I think it was the first and third Thursday. Oh and blocking folks left and right. In these campaigns for justice, because the vote is so essential, things don't always go as scripted. How did you and do you know when you have these kinds of revelations where you need to either pull back or expand? So I know one of the things you did was um, to actually go out into the county after Selma had begun to dry up a bit. How do you know when to make those kinds of strategic moves? Well, when we exhaust 
one uh, category, what you do is look for another. And we had exhausted the number of people who were in Selma, Alabama, who uh, were eligible to register to vote. Those who were, when I say exhaust, I mean those who were not afraid. Right. Uh, we had gotten that number. Now, actually, <laughs> there were some people who uh, told us they were registered to vote. They were already registered. And specifically, school teachers. Now, they had tried, mm -hmm. and they had been denied. But then you had some of those folk who were not so educated, who bragged about the fact they had registered to vote. They had passed the test. And they had put their X on the uh, signature line. So to tell you the truth, there were some people they had allowed to register to vote to try to prove a point. Mm -hmm. OK? Like, for example, there was one fellow, a white man, who came to me and said, I understand that you are helping uh, black folks learn how to register to vote. I said, yes, it's true. He said, well, I got a bunch of, uh, he didn't call them Negroes, uh, but you know what he called them. Mm -hmm. I have a bunch of them uh, that work for me, and I want to get them registered. And I said to myself, he wants these black people to get registered to vote? I'm certainly not going to turn them down. Well, see, he had a son who was just uh, graduating from college and was going to come back in, uh, to home you know, there in Dallas County, and was going to run for office, public office. So he knew that if he got all his Negroes registered to vote, that would be just a big pile of votes right there, <laughs> OK? Because he would tell them how to vote. Mm -hmm. Then I thought about it, but I said to myself, my job is not to tell people how to vote. My job is to, get them, to tell them how to get registered to vote. And maybe even they would vote for his son this time, but maybe by the next time, they'd be voting for their own son. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I wrestled with it, but not long, because I was clear. And uh, we did do that. That was one incident. The other is there was a, a community called Boga Cheetah. And Boga Cheetah was right there in Dallas County, not too far from Selma. And Boga Cheetah was a uh, pretty much a solid black community. And these were people who had their own schools, and they, you know, a lot of them were farmers, and most of them were, et cetera. And those are the kind of jobs. It was self-sufficient, though. It was understood that they took care of themselves. If you have a house and you have uh, some land, mm -hmm. and you can grow your food and some animals and all that kind of thing, hey, you can pretty much, uh, you know, take care of yourself. So they had an independent kind of community. In fact, the rumor was that if you did something in Selma, Alabama, and you crossed that creek into Boca Chita, policemen are going to go up in there. OK, because these people here were not uh, learned, as you say. So they didn't know to be scared of white folks. <laughs> I mean, you have to be trained to be scared of white folks. You know what I'm talking about? You don't just up and say, but because you're white, you know, be scared. No, you have to be taught that. You have to be cultivated. It has to be inculcated. OK? So these people didn't have that uh, benefit. So they didn't know they were supposed to be scared of white folk. So, uh, but the white folks knew better. They didn't go up in there. You know, that was their thing. So yeah. learning that is when I decided that when we'd exhausted the number of people in Selma who wanted to register to vote, go to Boca Chita. Yeah. It was in Dallas County. When I went there, they listened to what I had to say, and they had their own church, which was their own school, and everything else. Everything was in one. So it was a, a unified community. And uh, they started coming out of the grove, so to speak, and going down to register to vote. That was a new day. Mm -hmm. Now, the dynamics was this. Once the so-called educated black folks in Selma saw these black folks out of Boca Cheetah going to register to vote, okay, 
that stimulated them. Because they said, well, now, if these people are going to be registered to vote, you know, what about us? So that gave them courage. So the strategy is that when you exhaust one group, you move to another group in terms of constituency. I had also the same situation with the uh, business community, the black business community. And by the way, you had to have a voucher, someone who was already registered to vote to sign for you. Yeah, that kind of thing. So there weren't too many who wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. But we found a pool of people who were willing to take the risk. And uh, it made a difference. And so that's when we started going, getting other groups. And then we got the young people involved. And that just changed the whole dynamics. Well, one of the things, this was a beautiful segue. I mean, you speak often and profoundly in your book about the Courageous Eight, those incredible leaders in Selma who stood up in this hate-filled space and were willing to do whatever. Can you speak about them and give us some sense of how, because most of them are unknown in these, in these kind of larger histories, but it really is the people who are in there day in and day out. Can you give us some sense of what they meant to the battle at Selma? Yes. When we found individuals who were willing to take a stand, it was an individual stand. But when you were able to bring them together to stand with each other, then you got a very powerful rock when people knew that there were others that they could depend on and they were going down together. The first person that comes to mind is Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Amelia Boynton. She is the reason why I decided that Selma was possible. She's tall, regal. In fact, I was just with her Thanksgiving Day, and uh, she was full of smiles. She goes for 103. I think she's a little bit older. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Actually, what she does is she's, when she turned 100 years old, then what she did afterwards had celebrations of the anniversary of the 100 years. <laughs> so that's a clue for you if you ever get there. She stood there, and she was convinced that we could make a difference. And she and her husband, Mr. Uh, Boynton, <laughs> Sam Boynton, I was, she used to take care of him. Uh, he was in a nursing home, and he was terminal, so she would stay with him at night. So some nights, I would relieve her, let her go home, and I would stay there, and the strangest thing happened. I would sit there on the side of the bed with him, and later on, I learned out what, um, when people have... Uh, wakes, you know, before funerals. Mm -hmm. Some folks didn't know what the wake is about. Some people don't know now. The wake is that you had someone to sit next to you. Yeah, I see him smiling. Charles, I think Charles, he thinks I know everything. He, he asked me, <laughs> Reverend, what is this wake about? Why do they call it a wake? Well, you know, there was a time when, you know, morticians didn't put all that stuff in you, you know, and try to preserve your body and that kind of thing. They would let you go with your soul and your body. Uh, and sometimes people would be in comas. Okay? They weren't really dead, but they were in comas. So what we would do is sit next to them at night, all night, in case that they come to. And there were, some people have injured themselves when people have come to. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> but uh, stop. okay, I'll stop. That's right, this will be about the movement. That's right. <laughs> not, not Dick Gregory. Okay, 
So what happened is that I would sit there and wait. And whenever he heard anybody walking down the hall, Mr. Boynton used to yell out, are you registered to vote? <laughs> <laughs> and people would literally run. Because <laughs> they didn't know whether, you know what was going on. But um, so the mysterious thing happened is I could feel a transfer. Some of you know what I mean. A transfer of his spirit. So he was actually the leader, although he was not originally the founder, he was the president when I was there, uh, the Dallas County Voters League, and he uh, gave that model and example. So this is what we're talking about. You don't really need, okay, a host. All you need is, okay, a few committed people as a model and example. That was one of the things I was learning in Selma, Alabama. So what happened is that these courageous eight they talk about, we met and we also let people know that we were the, the Dallas County Voters League, okay? And we met in Mrs. Boynton's office and that was uh, also Attorney Chestnut's office mm -hmm. and there's so much I can say about him. But there was Gildersleeve and there was Mr. Blackman, okay? And what happened in Selma before I got there, uh, there were 10 people who had signed a petition to desegregate the schools. And that was the process. And I just want to put a little plug in here for Constance Baker Modley was a lawyer, the woman, female lawyer, okay, who wrote most of the briefs for those Supreme Court cases that Thurgood Marshall won and the other lawyers, okay? I want to say that, all right. So she's the one. And uh, so when we, we got there, and by the way, I said that to say that in 1955, there was another Supreme Court decision about the schools. See, the first one had to do with ruling out the fact uh, that uh, there could be separation and yet equal education. Mm -hmm. And so that just basically said that separate but equal is no longer a valid theory, sociologically speaking, okay? So it became a legal precedence in the 54 Supreme Court decision. But it was a 55 case that Motley argued as well that said, gave the procedure for desegregating the schools. Well, prior to going to Selma, there were 10 people who had based on the 55 Supreme Court decision, had signed a petition, and the requirement was that you would uh, get 10 signatures, present it before the school board. If they ignored you, you could appeal it to uh, the uh, uh, federal court, okay? And uh, if they denied you, the same thing. You could appeal it within a certain period of time. And so, that procedure was in order. When I got there, there was only one name left on the petition mm -hmm. because they've been run out of town, they've uh, you know, lost their jobs and they all kind of harassment. But one name, Mr. Blackman, was it Blackman or Gildersleeve? Can't think of the name now, or Blackman. But one of those who decided that no matter what, a name would not be removed. Mm. Work for the post office, okay? The feds. Yeah. Now, the people who were on that Courageous Eight were independent business people, all right? And they uh, believed that they had to take a stand, and they did. And they uh, set the example for everybody else. And now, I want to say this. <laughs> What is it that made Selma so different? Well, in my research, there are about eight families. Mm -hmm. And if you, uh, these are white families, of course. And if you married into that family, you never have to worry about a job. Okay? Now, I have to say this. The people in Selma was much more sophisticated. Even though they... Uh, you saw that violence in the streets and that kind of thing, et cetera. Not one church was bombed. 
They bombed churches in uh, what? Bomb Birmingham, all over the place. Bomb motels, bomb uh, you know Shuttlesworth House, <laughs> Silver Times, okay, and they they bomb uh, in Al uh, down in uh, Montgomery, all those places and stuff like that. Martin Luther King's house, Abernathy's church, up there in Birmingham, they bomb A.D.'s house, you know, Martin Luther King's brother's house. The point I'm making is that um, there were no bombs in Selma because they used a very sophisticated approach. And I studied that approach. It's very interesting. So if I went to the mass meeting, mm -hmm. okay, they wouldn't come after me all the time. They would go and fire my mother-in-law from her job and tell her she needs to spend more time with her son-in-law. And if you get your mother-in-law fired from her job, <laughs> how long do you think you're going to stay in town? <laughs> okay. Uh, that was the approach they used. They didn't kill black folks in, in Selma. That was over in Marion, Alabama. A state trooper killed Jimmy D. Jackson. Yeah. But even in that Selma movement, more white people got killed than blacks. Okay? They had blacks in their hands. And the other condition was that Selma was small enough that they knew everybody's family. Mm -hmm. And all the family members, they knew your children, they knew everybody, okay? So they could put their hands on you whenever they got ready. All right? So the size has a lot to do with it. But you know, even though Selma was small, it loomed large in terms of the movement. Very large. Let's talk about the violence. Because you were the target of an assassination plot. You tell it powerfully in the book. And it was an assassination plot that had three targets. One in Mississippi, one in Louisiana, and you in Alabama. The one in Mississippi was Medgar Evers. What was it like? How did your strength of your spirit, your faith, and your training in nonviolence help you through that moment? Well, first of all, I knew uh, Ben Elton Cox from the Freedom Rides. And, um, you know, he was over in Louisiana. He worked for CORE, Congress of Racial Equality. He's on the film. You see him, very prominent person. Medgar Evers, I, know, I knew him very well. He's the one that set up the office for us on Lynch Street in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. When we had the Freedom Rides, some of us stayed over and started recruiting people from Jackson, Mississippi, because at that point in the Freedom Rides, the governor had come out on the front page of the newspaper and said he applauded the Negroes from Mississippi for not getting involved with these outside northern, you know, communist agitators or something. And that was an insult. But the truth of the matter is, we stayed in jail, and those of us from Nashville went to, uh, on the Freedom Ride early so we could give some direction to the students who were getting out of the exams, okay? So they could go and follow us on into jail. And they came from all over, but not Mississippi. So we decided we are going to find out what the problem is, Jim Bevel and I. So we stayed over. Medgar Evers helped us set up an office. Within two weeks, we had recruited 42 people from Jackson, Mississippi to go on the Freedom Rides. And uh, then they arrested us again, OK? So I was arrested. I, I've even been arrested while I was in jail. So. <laughs> It was Charles Alphen who ran my record to tell me how many times I've been arrested, and I didn't even know. I mean, you know, going arrested is how many times you played football or something. But uh, 
When Medgar Evers was uh, killed that same night, I was attacked. And I didn't know Medgar Evers had been killed until the next day because I was in the hospital. Now, I didn't get injured that bad. I had seven stitches, and, uh, but they kept me over for observations to see whether or not there was any serious damage. And my mother claims that it was. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still in that movement? <laughs> well, she felt that the, you know, the head wounds had more, you know, serious effect on me. And uh, I mean, I don't doubt her, but you know, thing <laughs> like no, mom. You know, argue with your mother about <laughs> things like that. But anyway, um, so the next day I found out, and it was uh, curious that it happened the same night. And the truth of the matter is, I did not put it together, okay? In fact, I didn't even know about Ben Elton Cox because he was out of town and they couldn't find him in Louisiana. But it was the FBI out of Mobile, Alabama, who came to investigate because all of these counties were under federal suits. They had injunctions not to interfere with people who were registered to vote. And so um, he came about uh, a week or so after the incident and told me, this is the FBI, he was head of the bureau, that uh, there was a three-state conspiracy. It was planned in New Orleans, Louisiana. They're supposed to have killed three of us the same night. And I was the third one there in Selma, Alabama. How did I feel? Well, first of all, it was a serious loss in terms of uh, Medgar Evers. I used to stay in the office, NAACP office, at night. I'm talking about all night. While Medgar Evers put on some old boots and some old hat on his head, farmer's clothes, overalls, and went to help tenant farmers sneak away and move off the plantations, in a sense, and to rescue people who wanted to go but couldn't leave. So he was not just in the office as executive, you know, they called him secretary. He was out there in the, uh, you know, fields with the people and that kind of thing. So he was a good model and example of what happened. And sitting there, I just thought about this. There are a number of nights when I did not expect Megger to come back. Because mm. he was out there by himself. Because he didn't want to be conspicuous, mm. OK? And I just would be waiting with every breath for his return. I only had relief when I heard the truck pull back up, you know? Yeah where he had helped them escape. It was like the Underground Railroad. That's what it was like. Yeah. yeah. So Medgar and I, it was not just somebody I knew, mm -hmm. but we were close and shared the same commitment. For me, <clears throat> in the movement, we had been trained by Jim Lawson and C.T. Vivian and others, Martin Luther King, a preeminent example, and what he'd gone through in Montgomery, and what he's going through in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. He was my model and example that you can only fully experience the meaning of life when you've made the decision to give it up. That's when you become totally free uninhibited. Death is like a chamber. Death chamber. And that's why being in jail was our freest moment in the movement. Because in spite of the fact that we were behind bars, we still owned ourselves. And we could make decisions. Like, we decided to transform the jail to a school. So when we got in jail, we set up lectures. If 
you were a biology major, we had a schedule for people to give lectures, okay, in the morning, okay? We had a silent period right after uh, lunch, give you food, a chance to digest. You don't want to buy a lecture if all the blood is on their <laughs> digestive system and less on their brain. So we gave them about an hour to, you know, digest their food a little bit. And then we had, uh, of course, in the morning, uh, you know, devotion. And then in the evening, after supper, we had a sermon, because we had all these preachers who were in jail. You know, and they were anxious to preach, so we had to rotate. Yes, in the last hour of the night before the lights went out, the clowns came on. And they told jokes and clowned and that kind of business, et cetera. We sang songs and that kind of business. Now, we controlled the schedule. We were, okay? Yeah. We transformed the prison, okay? to uh, our university. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the place is named by its activity, okay? Not what it's supposed to do, but what does it do? And so when you are free, mm -hmm. okay, even when you're in jail, because no one could take your life if you've already decided you're going to give it for something that's worthwhile. Some people lose their lives for foolishness. Yes. But when you decide you're going to give it to something that you want to give it to, then you're totally free. No matter what happened. Now everybody, like Martin Luther King said, would like to live a long time. Nobody has anything against that. But if you don't live a life of, of quality and virtue and that sort of thing, okay, then uh, for all practical purposes, you know, you don't have a life. And some people put it that way. And one of the things that became clear as well, it was in that transformation that was happening in Selma where the fear also began to subside uh, for African Americans in Selma. Um, when the, you saw that fear just melting away. Um, and particularly after you came out of the hospital and they were like, okay, yeah, we've got this. We've got this. That's powerful. Um, you have, because I'm going to get to my last question last. You have worked in multiple venues using nonviolent direct action to transform communities. You have worked with the gangs in Chicago. You have worked in the Deep South. You have worked in Colombia. You have worked in Africa. Can you begin to tell us about how you're, you're able to apply effectively these tactics across different histories and different geographies? Uh, that's fascinating to me also. <laughs> um, well, I was with Martin Luther King the day that he was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, he had named me the national coordinator for the Poor People's Campaign. And I always had an interest in the relationship with Martin Luther King because I had a lot of respect for him. I still do, of course. But um, I used to, you know, negotiate with him. And uh, Martin Luther King always said that you don't negotiate with brothers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You say what you need and you get it. Okay. <laughs> but um, I was actually in Chicago. And Martin Luther King called me and said that uh, he wanted me to come down to Atlanta because they were going to reorganize uh, SCLC. And he wanted me to have some administrative or executive position. And uh, I was working for the Quakers, American Friends Service Committee. And they had a lot of benefits, and they paid every month. 
it's, it's a little thing, but it's a big thing. Being in the movement, you get paid every month. That was, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's movement. <laughs> yeah, that was really something different. And they even had paternity leave back in that day. Ooh. In the mid-60s, American Friends Service Committee, if, uh, if your wife got pregnant or something like that, then you could take off also, even though you're going to have a baby. But, you know, you, paternity, like maternity leave. Yeah. And they would pay your mileage. If you go to work and then you have to drive and go to another meeting, mm -hmm. you 22 cents a mile, same as the government. Yeah, sure. And, and uh, then Martin Luther King said, I want you to come down here to Atlanta. I said, well, listen, Dr. King, whatever you need me to do, you know I'll do it, but I don't have to leave the American Prince Service. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they were very supportive, and they would let me just go wherever I wanted to go and do, you know. It was, yeah. He said, no, I want you to come down to Atlanta, move to Atlanta. Wow, move to Atlanta. So I said, uh, well, do you have a job description? <laughs> See, before then, we didn't have job descriptions in the movement. <laughs> I was the first one started that. <laughs> you just do what needs to be done, right? Yeah. So he said, um, uh, well, he said, we'll work on one when you get here. I said, okay, Dr. King, all right. So I said, um, or just could you send me a, a letter of invitation, you know, something, let me know that, uh, you know, I'm special. Because I had gotten with the service committee then, you have to do a lot of paper stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. I learned that, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> Oh, I don't know, about a month passed, nothing. And so Dr. King called me again, and he said, uh, listen, I thought you told me you were coming down here to Atlanta. I said, I am. I'm just waiting for the invitation. And he was on the phone. He said, Andy, did you send that uh, uh, invitation or that job description to Lafayette? He called me Lafayette because the other fellow who worked was Bernard Lee. He wanted to get the Bernards mixed up, okay? So I said, uh, well... Okay, all right. Martin Luther King told me in a very frank, straight, no nonsense terms. He said, "He said Lafayette, I need you to come down here because we're working on a campaign now, and this may be my last campaign, and we're going for broke." Mm. Well, that's the thing that got me mm. going for broke. The Poor People's Campaign. Who was going to end up being poor? <laughs> you know. <laughs> But you got me if you're going for broke. Yeah. And that's how I got down. But I was with him the last day, and we were working on a press statement. I was scheduled to go to Washington, D.C., and uh, because he I was going to stay in Memphis because the march had been broken up in violence. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, okay, I need you to go to Washington, D.C., to open up the campaign office. So we worked on this press release that night. The mountaintop speech, I was waiting, working on the press statement in his room, okay, for him to come back. He didn't want to go. It was raining, as they say in the country, cats and dogs. He'd already gotten in bed, he was exhausted. <coughs> the media had given him down the creek for that, uh, the violence. And so anyway, uh, I uh, was going to go. So that morning, we finished tweaking the press statement, and um, I was getting ready to go to Washington. And he made this statement, which was a non-sequitur. It had nothing to do with the uh, press statement. He said, now, Lafayette? No, yeah. He said, I think he called me Bernard then, yeah. He said, um, the next movement we're going to have is to institutionalize and to internationalize nonviolence. And I said, okay, comma, for further discussion. I got on the plane, and five hours later, Martin Luther King had been shot. There was a UPI reporter told me on the telephone, because when I got to the airport, nobody was there, and I called the press when I found out Martin Luther King had been shot. I didn't think he was going to die, because oftentimes people get shot, but they don't die, you know? But... The UPI reporter broke down in tears and told me Martin Luther King was dead. So I remember his last words 
to me, the institutionalized and internationalized nonviolence. So I had to go to work. First, I had to go to school and try to figure out, you know, how to institutionalize things. So one of the most prevalent institutions throughout our country are educational institutions, they're in, and also prisons. <laughs> they're in every community, schools. And if we're going to institutionalize nonviolence, that would be a, a place, you know, to do it in schools. That's an institution. Also in churches. So I was already, you know, into the ministry. So what I needed to do was learn something about education. That's when I went yeah, to graduate school. I had to learn how to think like a lawyer and all that sort of thing, et cetera. International. It was actually Glenn Smiley that got me going internationally. Glenn Smiley. With FOR, Fellowship of Reconciliation. One of the titles that's not in my CV, but <laughs> I had so many titles before, was the uh, director of HOPLA. HOPLA was the uh, Justice and Peace in Latin America. And I went on a tour, and I went to uh, Latin America, El Salvador, Venezuela, okay, Mexico, all right. And uh, Kate went with me, my wife Kate. Okay. Uh, she's the reason why I know I'm going to heaven. <laughs> and, and just how might that be? Uh, yeah, because uh, the, the Lord knew I needed some guidance, so he sent me an angel. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Show me how to get there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, uh, yes. Oh, and I was so excited to see uh, Harold Sanchez. And back there, raise your hand, Harold. <laughs> Harold is from Colombia, and uh, Charles Alfin, uh, uh, who sits there, very tall in statue, my chief uh, partners in training, and uh, we got invited to go to uh, Colombia, and um, we um, started doing some nonviolence training there. And uh, Harold sent for us. He was in uh, Bella Vista. And he said, uh, we want you to come here. And I understood very quickly if someone in uh, Bella Vista, the, the most notorious prison there, they were killing six people a day in the prison. Mm -hmm. That was the average, six people a day, the inmates killing each other. Uh, when he sent for us, uh, they told us it would be a good idea if we went. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So Harold was interested in us, uh, you know, doing, helping to stop the killing in prison. So to make a long story short, he's the one that was, was responsible for bringing us in. He was in charge of the talking table, all the inmates, and he was able to put this program into the prison. So that's the only nonviolent prison in Probably the world, mm. yeah, there in, in uh, Bella Vista, okay? He's the one responsible for that, okay? And then Charles and I went to, uh, Charles, raise your hand there, okay? Charles Alfin went to uh, South Africa. A lot of people don't even know about this, and we're just putting it together ourselves. <laughs> they were doing Mandela's election. They were killing the, each other. I mean, the blacks, mm -hmm. the different uh, tribal groups, they would come and they see another group standing in line trying to get ready to vote with an automatic weapon. They would come and shoot and kill all of them. This was during Mandela's election, okay? And Budalese's group mm -hmm. was one of them. They were rivals, and they used to kill each other. I didn't believe this, you know, and sometimes some things are so far-fetched you don't believe them. I had to see with my own eyes. So somebody helped me see with my own eyes. The South African government would bring bullets, okay? They would bring ammunition and drop it off in the black neighborhoods so that the rival groups would have ammunition to kill each other over the weekend. Okay? Yes. So we stopped that. Thank you. Okay. And uh, 
We uh, have had quite a bit of, uh, well, Nigeria was the last one I'll mention here for you, because the next question. Uh, it was uh, Alan Onima who had the foundation for ethnic, uh, you know, harmony in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And these, uh, uh, they call them freedom fighters, but they were concerned about the oil spills and the way the government had ignored, you know, the cleanup and that kind of thing. You know, their farms and everything else got, you know, messed up. And they were killing uh, government troops. And the idea came up uh, that if we would train some of the leaders in nonviolence, that would reduce the number of killings, but also raise the oil production because they were blowing up oil pipes and everything else. Mm -hmm. So um, we went in, and today, up to now, we've trained 26,000 Nigerians from Niger Delta area. And those Nigerians uh, have put down their weapons. I thought 70% effective would be good. Mm -mm. 100. Not one has gone back and picked up their AK-47. They're in 24 countries right now learning other skills. The government is paying for them in the amnesty program. You know, you can Google it, all right? And they're in Texas, Houston, Texas. They're in West Palm Beach, Florida, underwater welding. They're in Nigeria, uh, rather, in, they're in uh, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, learning to be airplane pilots. They're all over. That's an example of transformation. And maybe that's what Martin Luther King had in mind. Yeah. But if people learn the alternatives to violence, mm. a country could use its resources differently. And we're working very hard here in the U.S. We have over about 2,000 trainers, okay, in various communities, in very small areas, stuff like that. Connecticut, the whole state of Connecticut, mm. and that'd be the same, you know, because of that. But I wanted to say, as uh, a president, a new president for SCLC has just come in, CEO, okay, and uh, he and Reverend C.T. Vivian made it possible for SCLC's rebirth and, uh, and, and new things that we're going to have you know, on a global level as well. Wonderful. Okay. And this is uh, my last question. I'm going to make it quick because I want to open it up for um, uh, the audience to ask you questions. The Voting Rights Act was the crowning achievement of Selma. Recently, the Supreme Court of the United States in Shelby County v. Holder has gutted key elements of the Voting Rights Act and the states rushed in with a series of voter suppression bills. What do you see as the next wave of mobilization, given all that was fought for in Selma? Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question, and it deserves a lot more time than I have available to answer it. But I just want to give you some clues mm -hmm. to this. First of all, why did they gut the voter registration uh, bill or act? The other question is, why was it necessary to have a voter registration act of 1965? Are there any examples in the past, in our history, where a vote gutted the uh, protection for the right to vote? Ah, Reconstruction. <laughs> yeah, there was a time when black folks were able to run for office, and they were free to vote, mm -hmm. and all that sort of thing happened. I think it was like one vote in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Well, I think 
uh, voting is kind of important. Okay? And that's why. Because that's where the power really is. And, and how do you get people to participate in government? Because that's what it means. Voting is one form of participating in government. But that vote is most powerful. So, uh, as a finagular, we used to say, I don't hear it too often now, they went into the juggler vein. Yeah, because that's what voting is, all right? Juggler vein, all right? Oh, by the way, uh, why did they change the, uh, to 18-year-old vote? I know we had it you know, in Texas and Kentucky. Because a survey was done, and they found out that the young people were more conservative. Yeah. So you didn't run a risk. OK? Yeah. So these are just questions, and that's what I do. I ask questions. OK? So the question you're asking is, what are we going to do about it? Well, the first thing we're going to do is what we just did. We're going to analyze what really happened and why it happened and how it happened and did it ever happen before? And what happened after that happened? And then when you get the answer, like uh, Charles Alphen always say, put it in the draw and then start with some more questions. So this is questionable stuff that it happened. All right? Now, here's what we got to do. All right? <laughs> We got to first of all admit that we made a mistake in the movement. We made some success and we accomplished some goals and we changed, took down some signs and, you know, the affirmative action bill that came out, you know, on the um, public accommodation bill out of, came out of the Birmingham movement, you know, and reaffirmed from the March on Washington and all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that affirmative action bill, all right, did two things. Number one, it expanded beyond race. We were talking about black folks being able to eat downtown. No, the most powerful thing was not your appetite. It was the fact that it expanded human rights to include women. Okay? The, gr the group that benefited most from the affirmative action bill was young white women. Because they say if you have the qualifications, you can't be discriminated against. And the white women had gone to school, they were lawyers and everything, they couldn't get any positions, huh? Okay? So, of course, it included all women, so it included black women too. That affirmative action clause. All right? The most important thing about the Affirmative Action Clause is that the burden of proof was now on the defendant. In other words, if you accuse somebody of discriminating against you because of you know, physical you know, impairment or either uh, you know, your gender or whatever, the defendant had to prove, OK, they were not discriminating. All right? So, a lot of things happen with that. The mistake we made was that after we got the federal government to give us protection for the right to vote, because we already had the right to vote, it was whether or not the federal government was going to protect us from state rule. You see, we still have the mentality here in the United States that we are nations, little nations. It shouldn't be called the United States. It could be the United Nations. <laughs> Sometimes disunited nations. Mm -hmm. Not united at all. Mm -hmm. Because each state has two senators, no matter how small it might be. It had nothing to do with the population. Just the fact that you're a state. Equal power, all states. The Senate, the way it's structured. We're not a democracy. We are a republic. Some people talk re republic for which we stand. That's what we stand for. OK? Yeah. So the point is, um, we should have 
establish in each county, in all of these counties that we're talking about. And that's where that uh, fifth, okay, section five comes in. Mm -hmm. They name some places mm -hmm. where they cannot make changes. Mm -hmm. and you know what they should have done? The mistake they made, it should have been universal. No state can make any changes. But that couldn't pass. You couldn't get it through at that time. All right. But then, okay, so some people say, you discriminate against us because we have to get approval, pre-approval, and what about these other places? So they got an argument, okay? But we know that those places also had a reputation who were doing that, all right? And they weren't all in the South. Yeah, Chicago, <laughs> Illinois, those places. If you had an independent party and you were running for office in, in Illinois, you had to get twice as many names on a petition as you would Okay, if you were running for a Republican or Democratic party. You see my point? That's unequal. <laughs> okay. All right. So we should have established in every county a citizenship education school, just like we have driver's education for children who are going to drive. It is just that dangerous to have people not educated uh, about their citizenship and about how they need to participate. It's not just voting, it's going to these meetings, going to everything. So and the short of it is this. Why, what if we had a youth legislature where you had from 12 to 17 year olds from every school, every school is in a different uh, district, congressional district, as well as the state legislative district. So you can start with the schools that are located in all these different districts. Political, okay? Nonpartisan, but political, all right? So my point is, they would be able to have, be able to drive the government if they had citizenship education. It's like you have drivers education. So my point is, this problem is very complicated. The solution is simple. Because this is a government for the people, but not by the people. So we, get to, we got to get the people to buy into government. That's the point. And these young people, they're not thinking about any who was running for office and that kind of business and who represents. They need to. You know why? Because it affects their tuition and how many loans they're going to have before they get out of school. They're sitting around looking pitiful about, you know, uh, how much it costs. You know who made the decision about the, the cost for education? Uh -huh. That's what you're voting on. Who's going to spend your tax money? Yeah, that's taxation without your representation. Nobody represents you. So that's my comment. <laughs> Thank you. We have several minutes for questions from the audience. Good evening. This was most enjoyable. Thank you both for being here and sharing. Uh, Dr. Lafayette, I was almost kind of wondering whether you were one of the jokesters or one of the preachers. Or <laughs> okay, had us cracking up here. Thank you for the levity. I'm sure it got you through a mini night at the jailhouse. I, my question really is about um, the Kennedy years, the administration, and um, of course, we just commemorated the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. Thinking about the language of freedom and how it was so universal at the time in the Cold War um, buildup and how with the space race and everything that if you go back and look at his speeches was about freedom, it was certainly couched in those terms, you know, freedom for Asians and South American, Latin Americans. And did it seem to freedom fighters, your young people your age at that time, 
that freedom was being discussed for everybody, but folk in the South, had he, was he too afraid to deal with the South when he could talk about and deal with every other country in the world as it related to freedom? Was that something that emboldened you know, the charge for, for young people in the movement? For some people who didn't have inside information, it would be, um, you know, a very um, curious and strange, you know, attitude not to uh, be speaking in behalf of the Afro American people, okay? Uh, we're talking about the Kennedy administration, okay? Kennedy ran, uh, won by a small margin, and had it not been for that margin of black votes, okay, he would not have won. No way. Not coming from Massachusetts and being a Catholic. The Baptist vote, okay? When Daddy King stood out there, okay, on Auburn Avenue and took off his Nixon button and put on his Kennedy button and sent a shockwave straight through the black community all over. Because for the most part, your most powerful blacks were Republicans. It was a growing number, okay? And the reason why is because you had a a uh, Dixiecrat, Democratic power base in the South that was most disrespectful to blacks and uh, unaccommodating, okay? So, what's the senator's name? Who was from Massachusetts? Who was Republican? Yeah, Ted Brooke, black senator. He was Republican. Oh, uh, you would remember, but they forgot that uh, James Farmer was Republican. They forgot that. Okay, <laughs> you see, yeah, the one who was a director of the Freedom Rides. Okay, I knew I was his cellmate down at Parchman, so we had a lot of conversations. I was also uh, Stokely Carmichael's cellmate in Hines County Jail. <laughs> He was a philosophy major from Howard University, and I was uh, a theology school student, all right? So we stayed up all night long <laughs> arguing <okay? laughs> with each other, became best of friends. Uh, so the thing that people don't know is the uh, Kennedy, why he didn't speak out in public, he knew that if he was going to win another a term, he had to make sure we had strong black vote in support. That's why we had the Southern Regional Council getting money from the Field Foundation and the Taconic Foundation. The Taconic Foundation, okay, gave money to the Southern Regional Council in order to start these campaign directorships in the South. Bob Moses, mm -hmm. Lafayette, Charles Sherrod, okay? Bill Hansen was the director for Arkansas. People don't talk about him too much. He was our white director, and he was director of the voter registration project in Arkansas, Bill Hansen, okay? Young white male. Right. Part of that money that we used to, to work on voter education in the South came from the Taconic Foundation, which was influenced and supported by the Kennedy administration. While he didn't speak out openly, he was very conscious of the fact that he needed that black vote if he was going to continue. He was encouraged to make that phone call to Mrs. King. And Mrs. King, at the end of the conversation with Kennedy, who was a senator, but a presidential candidate, said to her, and she was very literal, just like my mother, 
is there anything I can do to help, let me know. And she did. She said, get my husband out of jail. <laughs> All right, down there in Reedsville. And of course, Kennedy did make the phone call, and that helped. But yes, I know there's a lot of discussion about the Kennedys, and particularly um, uh, John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy. But I want you to have that piece of information while you put the rest of it together. A lot of what people say, you know, is uh, true. But you have to get the whole to get the truth. So you have to take in all things. All right? Now, did we want him to speak out more? Yes. yes. But was he trying to help black folks get registered to vote? Yes. Was his record on civil rights when he was a senator very strong? No. <laughs> but did he support those, okay, bills and those efforts and things like that, et cetera? I met with Kennedy while he was running for the presidency up in New York. SNCC group. Those of us who were involved in SNCC, we had a meeting with him. All right. So. Another question? What do you think is behind the voter suppression activity right now? Is it just that the right has had time to to create this plan for voter suppression, or is there something else going on? <clears throat> the it's a it's a it's a what do you call um, a cycle? The cycle has to do with economics and politics. And if you're going to make sure that you have control over the economics, you got to have the greatest power and influence with two entities of government. All right? One would be the political, you know, congressional, and the other would be the military. Now, it is true that the military can act without a vote of Congress, they should not if they're going to start a war, but you don't call it a war. It's what label you put on it. Okay? All right. So the point is, more directly, is that um, the what you're experiencing during this period is what I describe as the third generation syndrome. The third generation syndromes follow this pattern. When a group comes over or migrates to another country, either way, they tend to preserve their culture. They bring that with them, the kind of sandals they wear, footwear, okay, to the headgear, all right? And that's the way they walk. Uh, the language they use, they want to preserve their tongue, okay, and uh, their medicine, okay, just no ways of handling problems. Sometimes they do real good by using their own, you know, <laughs> medicine, okay. Um, but more important is embracing what you uh, have experienced in the past, okay. Unlike the slaves, they were deliberately divided in order to destroy the sense of unity and that kind of thing. The, the, the tribes were uh, you know, dispersed in such a way that you didn't have that. They wanted to destroy the language because language is very important in terms of community as well as communication, language, okay? Second generation, assimilation. Let's be like them. 
So we get our hair cut and we get our, okay? Cut a lot of other things. Not only just hair, we cut. Cut that language out, cut that religion out, cut, cut, cut. Fade right in. Third generation, let's see what grandmother was like. I want to eat some of her food, some of her, you know, rather than uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, you know, or hamburgers, whatever. Let's go back, our roots. You remember when it happened to blacks? That's when you see those photographs of those dashikis and those uh, afros, okay? And some of them, you know, coming back a little bit now. But that's the third generation syndrome is going back. So if other cultures have third generation syndromes, then some of the white conservatives also. <clears throat> when they look at the movie, 12 Years of Slavery, they're looking at their grandfolk, you know, and how they lost their property. I mean, the slaves, you know? So how can we get back in control? That's the whole question. Okay, you like it? Yeah. <laughs> and you could do it. <laughs> yeah, Reverend Daly could do it. So uh, that's why I teach. And you, you preach, okay? <laughs> okay. So... Um, that third generation, that third, uh, yeah, generation syndrome is, is one that uh, helps us to observe the disappointment that people have. And more important than that, they have let their grandfathers down. They used to own this land, they used to control it. Why do you think they call it the White House? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so my point is, uh, how would you feel if your grand folks had worked and got property and stuff for you, and, and you turn around and looking pitiful and unemployed and then lost all that? And I can understand if you were asleep, you know, and saying, and mess around and let a black man get in the presidency. And, but two times, you know, what's going wrong here? <laughs> We're not doing something right, you know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, those who have that attitude, you know, I quickly say it's not all whites, because you can see in my book how some white folks saved my life. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So we're not talking about a broad brush here. But the thing that amazed me is that a few people can have so much power. That's what segregation was about, keeping us from talking to each other. That's all they were talking about? No. <laughs> uh -uh. They didn't want us to talk to each other because we discovered that we have so much in common. Okay? <laughs> Until they say, well, I'm poor and I'm white. <laughs> how'd you get to be poor? All right? You're supposed to be white, and how'd you get to be poor? Somebody stole our money. Yeah. Our money. It's us. And the only way that things are going to change is that us got to get together and put our heads together, okay, and start participating in the decision making. All right. I forgot what the question was, but that's. A <laughs> well, we're going to have to close on that last question. <laughs> okay. And so I want to give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.